Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center and to today's convening of America's Town Hall. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president and CEO of this wonderful institution. Let us inspire ourselves for the learning ahead by reciting together the National Constitution Center's mission statement. Here we go. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the U.S. Constitution among the American people on a nonpartisan basis. This is the second in a wonderful series of panels co-sponsored by the cultural services of the French embassy, which compare US and French approaches to the constitution. I wanna share that yesterday I was hiking in Rock Creek Park in uh, the US and um, I came across a monument to the French ambassador Jusserand, and it was right by a cliff where he used to hike with Theodore Roosevelt. And there's a wonderful inscription right by it, which I want to read because it reminds us of the central uh, fraternity of the US and France in defending values like free speech and liberty. This is what Franklin Roosevelt said in dedicating this Jusserand memorial in 1936. He said, we shall link Mr. Jusserand's name forever with the names of Lafayette and Rochambeau and de Grasse and the other valiant Frenchmen whose service to this country entitles them for all time to the grateful remembrance of all Americans. It is an inspiring dedication and it reminds us of the central enlightenment values that we share in the US and France, the central role of France in making American independence possible and our uh, shared commitment to free speech. So we're gonna explore that today with four of the greatest uh, scholars and commentators of free speech in America and France. And I'm so delighted to introduce them to you and then to begin our discussion. And uh, I will do that now. Uh, Marc-Olivier Béret is staff editor and reporter for the ideas debate section of Le Monde. Uh, he, um, his articles are illuminating and I learn from them each time I read them. Uh, he was a Neiman fellow uh, at Harvard uh, in 2021, and I think in, is now, and has been published in uh, many magazines and has translated uh, several books, including Jonathan Israel's Revolutionary Ideas. Suzanne Nossel is the CEO of PEN America, the leading human rights and free expression organization. She is the author of Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All, an important book that we had an illuminating discussion of on a recent uh, uh, town hall. Jeffrey Stone is Edward H. Levy, Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago. He is the author of many centrally important books on constitutional law, including The Free Speech Century, Speaking Out, Reflections of Law, Liberty, and Justice, Perilous Times, Free Speech and Wartime. Uh, his newest book, co-edited with Lee Bollinger, is National Security Leaks and Freedom of the Press. And he is the author of the National Constitution Center's explainer on the First Amendment with Eugene Volek. And Hélène Tigrugia is law professor at Aix-Marseille University in France, co-director of the law school's master's program of international law, and an expert on reparations before the International Criminal Court. She's also a member of the UN Human Rights Committee. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Marc Olivier, Suzanne, Jeff, and Hélène. Uh, Jeff, I want to begin with you. Uh, you wrote a piece about the Charlie Hebdo controversy in France, explaining why in America, the publication of the Charlie Hebdo cartoons, uh, although considered blasphemous by some, would uh, absolutely be protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution. Tell us why the First Amendment protects blasphemy, what the central cases that protect uh, blasphemous expression are, and uh, under what circumstances in the First Amendment um, offensive speech can be banned? So there have been laws in the United States in the past uh, that prohibited blasphemy. Um, and if you go back to the late um, 18th and early 19th centuries, there were occasional prosecutions uh, for blasphemous speech. But um, over the last hundred years or so, it's become clear that the concept of punishment for blasphemy uh, 
uh, clearly violates both the free speech clause of the Constitution and the free exercise clause of the Constitution. And there, to my knowledge, hasn't been a successful prosecution for blasphemy in this country in close to a, a century. Um, the, in the Charlie Hebdo situation, uh, the issue that would arise today uh, would be less one about blasphemy and more one about whether the speech created a danger of a violent response. And uh, their First Amendment jurisprudence in the United States has evolved over the course of the past century um, and has become much more speech protective over time. Um, in 1951, the Supreme Court had a case called Finer versus New York, uh, in which an individual was giving a speech on a public street that was clearly upsetting to uh, a number of observers. And the police eventually uh, ordered him to stop speaking, uh, arrested him because of the concern that there might be a violent response. And the Supreme Court, in a sharply divided decision, upheld the conviction and said that the First Amendment did not protect uh, his speech in that circumstance. Um, in the uh, 70 years since then, however, uh, free speech doctrine has continued to evolve. Um, and in 1969, in the Supreme Court's decision in Brandenburg versus Ohio, uh, this was a situation in which a a Nazi speaker uh, was engaged in um, highly inflammatory speech uh, and was arrested because of the concern that that speech would, um, would cause others to engage in uh, racist violence against others. And the Supreme Court uh, held that he could not constitutionally be punished in that situation unless the government could prove that he had the specific intent to cause that harm and that there was a, the harm was likely imminent and grave. Uh, a test that the court has to this day never held to have been uh, satisfied. Um, now, it, the Charlie Hebdo situation raises a really dramatic example of that problem, because let's suppose that after the first incident, um, we were to have a second publication of the same types of cartoons, knowing what happened the first time. And the question then would be, how many times can you do this, knowing that the response is likely to be to trigger violence. Um, obviously the magazine would say, we did not have the specific intent of causing that, but the government could say there's a clear and present danger. We know this from past experience. Supreme Court's never addressed that question. It's never had to address that question. Um, and, uh, but my guess is that in except in a situation in which the danger was, as I said, clear, present and grave, uh, the courts would uphold the right of the magazine or the speaker to engage in the speech and put the burden on government to avoid the violence um, by providing protection against it. But the court has not had a really Charlie Hebdo type situation in the United States um, since Brandenburg. And it's not 100% clear what the court would do, uh, particularly if, if this was the second time it happened and we already knew what, it, what had occurred in the first instance. Thank you so much for that extremely clear uh, explanation of the Brandenburg standard uh, speech, as you just said, in the U.S. Uh, must be protected unless it is intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. Uh, and you said there might be some question about that for a second publication of the Charlie Hebdo cartoons. Hélène, what is the source of protection for free speech in France? Is it the Constitution? Is it statute? Um, are the Shelley Hebdo cartoons protected? And what are the circumstances under which free speech can be restricted as incitement to violence in France? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for the question. Very important, of course, because it's an important difference between French and the US and, and on, this, uh, on this topic and the, uh, the question of limitation. Uh, the first, the first difference is in terms of legal protection, because of course we do not have a, a similar First Amendment. Uh, the freedom of speech is protected by different statutes and very important statutes in France. Uh, of course, there are also uh, very important decisions from the French. Um, Conseil Constitutionnel, so the French Constitutional Court, uh, also the, the case law of the European Court of, uh, of Human Rights. But um, I would say from a general point of view, the statute of um, 
freedom of speech and the scope, the very wide scope of the freedom of speech is very different in, Fran in France compared to, uh, to the US. And uh, in relation to uh, what just have been said, uh, for instance, uh, in order to limit the freedom of speech or the press uh, uh, freedom, uh, the requirement is not as high as uh, the imminent violence uh, uh, um, requirement or the uh, danger requirement. Actually, um, the French approach to freedom of speech is really more balanced, I would say. And uh, I, I, we will develop this point maybe later, but uh, uh, actually uh, journalists, media, etc of course, are uh, understood as a, as a key element of a democratic society. And as such, they, have, they, they are protected. But in the meantime, they have duties and responsibilities. And for instance, uh, uh, I would just give uh, two examples of limitations. Apology of terrorism. A journalist cannot, for instance, publish cartoons, jokes, etc., on terrorism. And we have um, different... Uh, uh, legislation applicable in France to this kind of apology of terrorism and it's prohibited and it's uh, uh, under uh, criminal, uh, it may be under criminal sanction, uh, even if it may be uh, considered as not uh, immediately dangerous or immediately calling for violent uh, act. And the other element, we, we just mentioned this, but the other element is criticism, criticism on religion. It really depends, again, uh, because we have to reconcile uh, the freedom of speech, the press, media, press freedom, etc., with the respect of uh, uh, reputation, uh, religions of others, and so on and so forth. So the, the bottom line is to say that we, 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 we do not have such a, a, a broad and wide scope of the freedom of speech, and it must be reconciled with uh, other uh, rights and liberties. Thank you very much for that. That is extremely clear and helpful as well. And it uh, supports uh, a, a, a publication on the French government website, which says everything you need to know about freedom of expression in France, which lists some of the exceptions that you just noted. The French government website says freedom of expression is enshrined in the Declaration of the Rights of Man, freedom of press and the law of 1881, but it has limits. Um, racism, anti-Semitism, racial hatred, justification of terrorism are not opinions, and the following are punishable by law, re reaffirming your point, Hélène, incitement to terrorism, which must be a direct and explicit incitement, not only in spirit, but also in its terms, public justification of terrorism, which consists in presenting or commenting on acts of terrorism while justifying or praising them. Since 2014, it's also punishable, it says, by seven years of incarceration. And then it also adds the following are punishable by law, public provocations to hatred, violence, or racial discrimination, public defamation on grounds of an actual or assumed membership in an ethnic, national, race, or religious group, public slander on the same grounds, and disputing crimes against humanity. Okay, Suzanne, you are a great international law expert. Uh, Jeff and Hélène have you know, put the broad principles on the table. Where, where do these exceptions in French law come from? Are they, are they by courts or, or are they by law? And is there some principle that justifies them or are they just a series of exceptions that French courts or French law have recognized and, and help us further understand the similarities and differences between the Brandenburg standard and all of these exceptions? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, um, I don't consider myself a great uh, legal expert, which is why I like to be on panels with uh, people like Jeff and, and Ellen. But, you know, what I will say is that uh, under the ICCPR, Article 19, which is essentially the international standard for protection of freedom of expression, it is less speech protective than the First Amendment. And it makes uh, space for concepts like incitement to hatred and incitement to discrimination as cognizable grounds for limitations on freedom of expression, which are criteria that we don't recognize here in the United States. So it's really in this area of incitement that the differences between a kind of global approach and the approach that is in use in Europe and the US approach are most striking, where we have this very high standard uh, that Jeff has outlined, you know, where it's very, you know, it's very hard to 
meet and it has to be uh, imminent and likely uh, to result in violence. Whereas in Europe, you know, you if it's incitement to discrimination and anti-Semitic uh, or racist cartoon, you know, that is judged as having a percent, uh, you know, a, a propensity to lead toward, you know, uh, stoking bigoted attitudes, you know, that can be banned there. And, you know, from a U.S. perspective, I think what's sort of troubling about that is, is just it seems very elastic. You know, it seems sort of enormously elastic. I mean, if you take it to, you know, things like sexism and, you know, depictions of women that might have a propensity to, you know, give rise to sexist attitudes, you know, that would be so much of film and television, maybe until, until the last couple of years. So, uh, you know, I think that's sort of the essence of this distinction. But, I, you know, I, I think it bears saying a couple of other things, you know, Jeff points out, look, in the, you know, in the United States, you couldn't have banned the Charlie Hebdo cartoons. I mean, that's true. Uh, you know, they certainly weren't banned in France. And that, you know, this, the whole controversy about those cartoons really has, you know, little to do with the law. Uh, you know, it's really mostly a matter of public attitudes. And, you know, even though the, the cartoons certainly would have been protected speech in this country, you know, they were not published and there were important, uh, you know, news outlets, you know, they were certainly new, you know, came a time when they were newsworthy and many news outlets uh, hesitated to publish them, uh, you know, because of a, a taboo that exists in this country. And I think that, you know, a lot of the focus in my book, Dare to Speak, is about how so many of our free speech controversies today really don't implicate the First Amendment or even international law. They have to do with mores and how we govern ourselves. And so I think it's hard to probe into these distinctions between a US and a French approach with, without uh, getting into some of that. Uh, you know, just to, to Jeff's point, you know, I think in this case, and, and, and my French colleagues will, uh, you know, contradict me if you think I'm wrong, I think there's a very, there's an excellent argument. They absolutely were on notice and continued to publish uh, provocative cartoons. You know, the, the Yellen's Post in, uh, controversy was back in 2006 and the uh, 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 Sharb, the editor of Charlie Hebdo was put on an Al-Qaeda, you know, most wanted list alongside the editors and journalists of Yellen's Post and because they republished the, the, you know, the so-called Danish cartoons. And so, you know, this, you know, that awareness, Dan, I thought it was interesting that you brought up the idea that a court might treat it differently, you know, if there was such clear evidence that it might elicit uh, a violent response, because I think that, you know, there probably was that evidence uh, in this case. You know, my own understanding of these precepts has always been, you know, this crucial distinction between kind of this incitement and, and provocation, with incitement being a kind of egging on, where you're really encouraging people to engage in violence and provocation being, you know, that you're saying something objectionable or outlandish or incendiary, and then in response, somebody that you have no control over, uh, you know, uh, engages in violence. And I, you know, I think and hope that that distinction is 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 a strong one because I think there's a very different level of kind of culpability. And if we start holding people responsible for the reactions of others. Uh, to what they say, even if those reactions may be predictable, you know, I think that's that sort of strikes me as, as quite a dangerous road to go down because it, it gives, it's kind of an amplified heckler's veto where if I sort of make clear in advance that I'm going to go nuclear, if you dare offend me in some or other way, you know, uh, your rights might be constricted on the basis of that. Thank you very much for all that, for flagging the danger of the heckler's veto, and for introducing the central legal authority. Uh, you called it the ICCPR, that's the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which protects freedom of expression in Articles 19 and 20. That article was uh, cited by the Facebook Advisory Board, which Suzanne, you uh, serve on, uh, in the recent uh, Trump v. Facebook decision where the advisory board noted that Facebook had invoked the ICCPR uh, in, uh, uh, in permitting necessary and proportionate restrictions on freedom of expression in situations of public emergency that threaten the life of the nation. And you note that that's more elastic than the First Amendment standards. Marc Olivier, just want, before we leave France entirely and broaden to the, to the international standard, 
you're one of the most thoughtful observers of the similarities and differences between French and American law. I, in, in, I, I'm still having trouble locating exactly where it is in French law that this free expression is protected, judicial decisions, statutes, or or the International Declaration for Rights of Man. Uh, legally and, 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 and culturally, how would you help us understand the differences between the French and American constitutional protections for free speech? Um, quite frankly, uh, Jeffrey, I thank you for, for this question and thank you for the invitation, but uh, I'm, I'm not uh, a, a legal uh, uh, scholar and I have very limited uh, um, legal uh, culture. I'm uh, more as a journalist, I'm a practitioner of uh, freedom of expression. And uh, what I can tell you about the, 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 the Charlie Hebdo uh, debate is that even though they are Charlie Hebdo was protected by is protected by French laws. It doesn't mean that there's a unified uh, um, uh, understanding of uh, these caricatures in France. It, it is the cause of major debates and or pages at Le Monde, the op-ed pages have been the the a theater where that that controversy has played out, and it's important to be, remember that even though uh, the, the, the France seems to be unified, as the, the French president is, seems to be pushing forward, saying, "Well, we must protect uh, the freedom of, uh, of expression of these journalists and of these uh, cartoonists," it doesn't mean that the whole society agrees on that. And uh, Le Monde was. Uh, uh, really keen after the attack to say je suis Charlie as it was then the key the the, the word that the expression that the whole uh, uh, a big part of France embraced and but I would also say that not I, I don't think that everybody in in, in our newsroom was uh, agreeing with that so it's important to remember that there are divisions and and other ways to look at these issues I wouldn't and uh, the the uh, the, the, the practice of freedom of expression raises those questions and they are they should be welcomed they are part of the democratic experience and as a as a journalist I felt I feel very much protected by the the the, the, the laws uh, which exist in France which which put borders on what we can do the call to violence is really clear it's it's forbidden which means that some article that uh, an article that was recently published in the American press in which got uh, 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 um, a, a major editor in a, in a major publication fired over a, 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 an op-ed that was uh, published under the, the title Send in the Troops, couldn't have been published in France. I couldn't publish that. I would have been legally liable for that. Call to violence or forbidden. Fascinating. So uh, you've just told us that uh, that is an example of, of uh, differences between the two protection and you could not have published the call on the troops op-ed. Very interesting indeed. Um, Jeff, uh, for, for, for this round, you know, both uh, all of your colleagues referred to these international standards. It, 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 clearly under international law, there's greater grounds for prohibiting hate speech in Europe than there is in the US. Holocaust denial is forbidden in Germany as well as uh, France. And James Whitman, the Yale scholar, has the most wonderful article about two conceptions of privacy, liberty versus dignity, where he says that the European uh, permissions for the prohibition of hate speech are rooted in protections of dignity, whereas the US is more focused on liberty. So take us out to a uh, US European comparison and tell us about the kinds of speech that could be banned under European and international instruments that could not be banned in the US. Well, the hate speech is a good example. And I think it's important to understand that uh, the United States has come to uh, a position that is uh, highly protective of uh, the right to free speech, but it didn't start there. Um, the Supreme Court, when it first began interpreting the First Amendment uh, in 1919, uh, upheld the convictions of a broad range of individuals who had criticized World War I and the draft uh, 
on the ground that such speech could interfere with the ability of the government to um, to draft soldiers and to fight the war successfully, and therefore it could be prohibited. And then later, um, during the communist era in the 1950s, the Supreme Court upheld the convictions of all of the leaders of the Communist Party on the ground that their speech could be harmful to the nation. Um, and during the civil rights era, uh, lower courts upheld uh, convictions of civil rights marchers um, because they uh, triggered a response by white onlookers that was seen as violent, and therefore you could punish the marchers uh, for, for doing this. And over time, what the Supreme Court came to understand is, first of all, um, we cannot trust ourselves to have the authority to decide what we as Americans can say. And in the moment, we may think we are being fair-minded and balanced and appropriate and proportionate, but with hindsight, we realize that our judgment has been severely colored by the circumstances um, and by the pressures of the time. And what the court learned over those decades is that it cannot trust ourselves and it cannot trust itself to have the authority to approve the suppression of speech um, when that speech uh, might be offensive uh, to others. Um, and even if it causes harm, unless the harm is essentially likely to create a imminent and, and, and grave uh, danger. Um, and it, it, one wouldn't start there. If one wanted to begin in 1919, one would have a hard time justifying such an extreme approach to free speech. Um, and even though, as we know, Justice Holmes and Justice Brandeis um, embraced an approach somewhat like that very early on, it's not even clear they would have carried it as far as we do today. Um, so I think a lot, of, a lot of First Amendment jurisprudence on this uh, issue is the, pro is the product of learning from our own mistakes and learning we cannot trust ourselves. And in particular, we cannot trust ourselves to allow the majority to decide what points of view can be prohibited. Yes, you can regulate speech in terms of the time, place, and manner of speech, not based on the message being communicated, as long as it's reasonable. But as soon as the government picks out particular points of view, whether it be anti-war speech or communist speech or civil rights speech or hate speech, um, we don't trust ourselves to do that. And we therefore err dramatically on the side of guaranteeing free speech. And there's a cost to that. It means we're allowing speech that does cause all sorts of harm in society. But what we learned is that better to deal with those harms than with the danger of giving the government the power to decide which ideas and which points of view it will censor. Thank you very much for that. Thank you for reminding us that the protections for hate speech uh, stemming from Brandenburg are relatively recent and that uh, they make the U.S. very much an outlier when it comes to the rest of the world. And then we can I, and, and, uh, Jeff, can I add one more thought on that? Because the Supreme Court did uphold the equivalent of a hate speech law in 1952 in a case called Beauharnais. Um, and uh, the court is, has clearly rejected the, the premise of that decision ever since. In the last half century, not a single justice has even argued that hate speech can be prohibited consistent with the First Amendment. Whether they're liberal or conservative makes no difference. For a half century now, every single justice who has addressed that question has embraced the view that hate speech is a point of view and we are not going to allow the government to suppress certain points of view. Sorry, I just wanted to mention the Bowerne case there. No, it's, a, it's, it's central and it's a reminder, as you said, that uh, it really hasn't been that long. Um, since the 1950s that the uh, US, as, as early as the 1950s, the US did allow the prohibition of hate speech, which really raises the question, which I'd love us to dig in on, uh, whether this is an aberration in, in US jurisprudence and there are tremendous pressures to move the US more in a European direction. And as we saw in the, in the Facebook decision where the advisory board invoked international law, and we see the uh, growing demands for the regulation of hate speech online, um, the question is, will and should the U.S. go more in an international direction? Ellen, you uh, are a scholar of international law. 
Help us understand now more of the international instruments that regulate free speech, including the one that Suzanne uh, flagged. And what are the precise, uh, I, uh, understanding that's a balancing of interests, how does international law balance interests of speakers against hate speech and what kind of hate speech does it allow the regulation of? Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm going to, to talk about uh, both uh, the ICCPR and I'm a member of the Human Rights Committee, so it's the body uh, in charge of um, dealing with uh, the implementation of the ICCPR and the European Court of Human Rights, because on this issue of limitation of uh, types of speech, both organs more or less have the same uh, approach to, uh, to limitation. I would say actually th th there are two kinds of uh, limitations of, uh, of, of speech uh, authorized at the international level. Um, or when, when a speech, for instance, is very offensive, discriminatory, or a, a speech targets, for instance, a community, there are many, many judgments uh, delivered by the European Court of Human Rights on uh, prohibition of a speech, for instance, that uh, targets uh, Roma community, for instance, or describes Roma community as a, a very bad community and, community and so on and so forth. So uh, the, the, the balance uh, made by the European Court of Human Rights and the Human Rights Committee is really a, a, a test of necessity and proportionality. Uh, the necessity, of course, to protect freedom of speech because it's an important pillar of democracy, but also the necessity to protect the rights of minorities, the rights of um, different groups and so on and so forth. And on a case by case analysis, uh, both the Human Rights Committee and the European Court of Human Rights uh, do assess whether uh, the limitation of the speech or the prohibition of the speech was uh, in conformity with the ICCPA or uh, the uh, European Convention of Human Rights. But there's also another type of discourse totally prohibited by international law. It's, uh, the, for instance, uh, as you mentioned, uh, genocide denials, uh, Holocaust uh, discourse, and so on and so forth. And in this case, it's not only a limitation of freedom of speech, but both in the European Convention and in the ICCPR, there is a provision dealing with abuse of rights. And when someone, for instance, makes a discourse denying the Holocaust, for the international bodies, it is considered as an abuse of rights. So it means that the person does not right, does not have the right anymore to use the freedom of speech and to claim the violation of his or her freedom of speech. So they, there are also many interesting uh, decisions, for instance, against France, uh, Forisson against France. Forisson is, is unfortunately, uh, I would say, a very famous um, uh, um, uh, person uh, who denies uh, Holocaust and Second World War and so on and so forth. And it, it came before the Human Rights Committee and the Human Rights Committee rejected uh, his, uh, his complaint. And we have another very recent example on uh, a performance, an, an artistic performance uh, dealing with uh, uh, Holocaust and, and uh, again, denying the Holocaust. Uh, the performance was prohibited by the French authorities and uh, the artist was not permitted to go before the European Court of Human Rights. So uh, indeed, on the contrary to, to, to the US, uh, the prohibition of this kind of uh, not only offensive or discriminatory discourses, but also very um, discourses, very harmful to dignity. You mentioned the concept of dignity is absolutely prohibited by uh, international and European um, European law. Thank you very much for that and for signaling this idea of dignity as the core of the international protections, which are is a very different approach than the U.S. one. Uh, Suzanne, uh, there are limits, of course, to what you can tell us about the Facebook advisory board, but it did cite the ICCPR centrally in its decisions. Do, do you see international law rather than the First Amendment as being the future of uh, free speech online, especially as the most of our speech takes place online and 
companies like Facebook are choosing to abide international rather than U.S. standards. And you mentioned the the malleability of the international standards. Um, is 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 that a good thing, or are are you concerned that uh, free speech may suffer as a result? Well, a couple of things. You know, first of all, it remains the case that the major social media platforms are U.S. based, and so the First Amendment does just heavily inform the milieu in which both the executives and uh, the legal counsels, you know, kind of uh, grew up and, and, and the way they understand the world. And I, I think the firm sort of uh, at least rhetorical commitment to free speech that is embedded in most of these platforms. I think when it comes to adjudicating content online, there is a very strong logic to uh, looking to international law as the standard because it's global. These issues are global. They're you know, looking at every jurisdiction uh, in the world. And so to the extent that the laws differ, I mean, obviously the national law comes into play and the platforms have to adhere to national law in the jurisdictions in which they operate. You know, France has adopted a, quite a restrictive uh, sort of digital uh, hate law that imposes harsh fines for platforms that fail to take down uh, hateful speech. And so, uh, you know, that arguably, you know, I think from a, a US lens, people would argue that so a provision like that might be in contravention of international law, might go too far. Uh, and yet the platforms are certainly bound to it. But I think when it comes to the oversight board, international law is the right reference point. It's important to understand, though, it is not, the notion is not that it applies directly uh, and automatically to the platforms. It doesn't. You know, international law binds uh, governments and was developed to address and, and, and uh, circumscribe the powers of government. So it requires a kind of inductive reasoning to think about how that power ought to apply to a private company. And I think there's some ideas in international law that are helpful. You know, the notion that a restriction on freedom of speech needs to be enumerated, that you need to, people need to be on notice that something is prohibited. The ideas of necessity and proportionality that uh, Elaine touched upon. So I think it's a useful reference point, you know, the work of figuring out how to apply it uh, sensibly in uh, you know, this, this global private uh, context of a private platform is, you know, really sort of now just getting underway. Uh, you know, will that then filter back to how U.S. courts adjudicate free speech issues? I think that's possible. I mean, we've already seen some courts around the world begin to reference these, you know, even just the earliest first few decisions of the oversight board, because they are, you know, the board is kind of confronting many of these cutting edge questions that courts may look at uh, as well. So, you know, that's, that's sort of how I would look at it. But I think it's important to recognize that, uh, you know, I don't think anybody's really arguing that we should treat private companies the same way that we do governments, we all accept and, you know, in fact, demand a much more aggressive level of uh, intervention, moderation, uh, takedowns from private companies than uh, we would accept from a government in the context of, of, of freedom of speech protections. Just to go to your, quickly to your, your original question about you know, whether this uh, slow slide uh, here in the U.S. toward a more internationalist and European approach is a good idea. Yeah, I think one of the, the, the factors that we're confronting on all of this is just, you know, the, as our societies become more diverse, these really difficult questions, I think, you know, Jeff lays it out very well, talking about how we've kind of learned these lessons the hard way about how dangerous it is to arrogate the power to do this line drawing uh, into the hands of government. And, you know, in Europe, it sort of seems very clear cut when it's anti-Semitism, but when it's anti-Muslim sentiment, you know, it, it's sort of a very different uh, prism that seems to apply when that speech is evaluated. And you can understand that sort of for historical and sociological reasons, but it, it raises real questions about you know, uh, whether any uh, uh, government authorities are really in a position to apply these precepts fairly. And, you know, if, if you question that, I think it, it sort of uh, tilts the balance toward more toward an American approach where, uh, you know, their, their discretion is limited. 
Thanks for that. And that, that's a great way of laying out the choices between the more international approach and the more American approach at an increasingly multicultural moment. Marc Olivier, we have a question from our uh, audience noting that um, uh, my, my screen is just froze, but it, it, it asked that uh, in light of your discussion of the Tom Cotton op-ed, uh, what about the publication of French army letters? So tell us about that controversy as well as other, uh, here we go. It's interesting to hear about the Tom Cotton op-ed in light of the French army letters published in the last month. Under what context are those allowed if the Cotton op-ed would not be? And um, uh, tell us about that and other areas as a journalist where you could not publish uh, stuff in France that would be published in the US. Concerning the, the army letter, I think it's, a bit early to really comment on the uh, the, the 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 legal aspect of, of it because it might it could go to 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 trial a complaint could be filed and I don't know what would happen quite frankly um, in terms of I, I think also that some of the authors were uh, have seen that their their relations to the, the French army were uh, cut off, you know. So it's already a form of sanction. Uh, uh, um, but uh, and clearly also, it wasn't published by the same kind of an institution. It was first published by uh, I think a, a, a blog. Then it was got republished by a, an ultra conservative um, uh, weekly. So it's not the same publication as where the Tom Cotton appeared and it's not the same thing as it, it appeared that it doesn't doesn't have the same kind of a general appeal so uh, it's difficult to compare them because uh, these things matter um, the second question of, of uh, uh, aspect of your question I I, uh, I think that it's important to to understand that the, the, the culture around freedom of speech, even though it's such a broad and universalistic principle, is not the same. Uh, you're not, they are, you know, the Moors are not the same. We, we don't conduct ourselves in the same way. Uh, for example, after the, the Charlie Hebdo uh, attack, the USA Today uh, published an op-ed, which didn't, wasn't really noticed in France at that time, but I remember reading it and being shocked because it was written by Njem Choudhary, uh, which is a, a so-called uh, Islamic cleric, uh, even though uh, uh, he defends uh, terrorism. Uh, and uh, he made different, you know, appearances in the, the, uh, the American press. I don't think it, I would publish such a person in an op-ed, you know, there would be another, it's okay to publish the, 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 the opinion of such a person, but there would be journalistic pushback. You wouldn't publish it in a, like an open format where this person is free to say whatever uh, they want. There would be a question from a journalist. Uh, so the, the practices of, a, of a freedom of speech are not the same. And I'm not saying that this one is better or the other is better. It's really, for me, uh, I think it's very, very difficult to make a, such a, 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 ju a judgment uh, like that. Um, uh, Professor Tri uh, Tigrudia, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, uh, I'm sorry, made allusion to uh, Alain Forisson, which is like uh, uh, France's uh, most famous uh, um, ne negationist. He started his career in Le Monde by publishing in 1977 an op-ed in which he explained that the Holocaust never happened. Um, uh, and this led to laws uh, being adopted to uh, condemn the, the, uh, the negation of uh, the Holocaust. Um, you could say it's a good thing. I believe it's a good thing. But a colleague of mine who works on the Resistance interviewed uh, um, one of the last lady uh, who fought in the Resistance. And for her, it was really important to publish that op-ed and to publish an op-ed. And again, I said an op-ed, not a, an, an interview with Alain Forisson, because she, she, she said, these views must be exposed. They must be shown and they must be expressed so that people can see them for what they are. 
And so for that, it's really difficult to, to, to make a judgment call and to say, well, this is the best and this is this doesn't work. I, I'm not in a position to, to make uh, such a comment, but I just want to underline that there are different ways to look at it. Thank you for laying out the arguments and for your you, you know modesty and in, in, in not choosing among them. Uh, but for this last round, I, I think I do want to ask each of you which tradition you would advocate for. Uh, one of our questioners notes the growing pressure in the U.S. toward the adoption of more European-style hate speech laws. And Jeff Stone, you uh, have written the leading protections for free speech on campus in the United States, the, your, your, your uh, uh, inspiring updating of the Chicago principles at the University of Chicago. Um, do you believe that, uh, and, and I'll also say in respect, as, as uh, the, the, the U.S. tradition um, is that Holocaust denial would have to be protected because, as Justice Brandeis said in the Whitney case, as long as there's time enough for deliberation, the best response to evil counsels is good ones. And, and we have faith that counter speech is better than suppression. Do you believe that the U.S. should resist efforts to adopt more European style prohibitions of hate speech and why? So I do believe that we should um, resist that. Um, and I think the Supreme Court would certainly uh, agree with that proposition. Um, the reason why is simply that I don't trust our government with the power to decide what ideas to suppress. Uh, again, looking back at our own experience, that's been abused repeatedly over time. And being able to define, you know, what is, what is hate speech? Right? Is hate speech criticizing African Americans, you know, Latinas, Asian Americans, Jews, Poles, uh, gays, straights, married people, unmarried people? I mean, it goes on and on and on. And um, I, I think that uh, in the end, we are better off allowing that kind of speech to be spoken and responding to it and looking for um, education and truth. And I think you know, one of the things we see in our, in our country is that by allowing speech that in many instances would have been suppressed if government had the authority to suppress speech that was seen as inappropriate, um, we've changed our minds. We've changed our minds about women's rights, about, about civil rights, about gay rights. If, if the majority had the authority to suppress that speech because it thought it was immoral, um, that gay should have equal rights or that women should have equal rights, um, I don't know we'd, we'd be where we are today. So there's a downside. I'm not saying it, there's not a risk in, in taking the American approach, but my own view is I'd rather take that risk than the risk of giving government the power to decide what ideas it will suppress and what it don't, would not suppress. And one, one way of thinking about that is, you know, what would the Trump administration have done if it had the authority to do that? Um, I wouldn't, I suspect, want to live in a country in which the Trump administration and the Republican Party had the authority to decide which ideas are impermissible because they're wrongheaded and unfair and hateful and whatever. Um, I don't think we would have the democracy that we strive to have today um, if we allowed that to happen. And that's the lesson we've learned from history. And I think it's the right lesson. Thank you for that inspiring defense of the American free speech tradition. Ellen, I, I want to ask you whether you think that the European tradition, which emphasizes dignity is uh, to, to be preferred. And I do wanna ask you about a fascinating speech that President Macron gave recently. He was uh, uh, denouncing uh, what he called Islamicist separatism and said that uh, a conscious theorized political religious project is materializing through repeated deviations from the Republic's universal values. And he, in particular, and notably, uh, called out uh, what he called uh, social science theories uh, imported from the United States, uh, by which he meant uh, critical race theories, uh, with their problems, which I respect and which exist, but which must be added to ours. He said these are Anglo-Saxon traditions based on a different history, which is not ours. This is a complicated but important intellectual uh, conflict between the more universalistic traditions that President Macron emphasized of uh, liberty, equality, fraternity, and dignity, and this more uh, multicultural or, or uh, 
identity politics based approach that he was questioning. Um, how is it possible that on, on the one hand, France is embracing this universalism against uh, critical race theory, but at the same time is allowing for more regulation of hate speech than the US regulate, uh, tradition allows? Yeah, very, very important questions, of course. Uh, maybe first on the uh, European model. Indeed, I, I'm, I'm really attached to this uh, European model. And, and just uh, to explain uh, uh, why uh, I'm, I'm going to use a, a French expression, the, the, the vivre ensemble. And I think that it's really difficult in, and it, for me, it's also linked to democracy, but it's really difficult to accept a very offensive, discriminatory discourse. Uh, if we want to bring a society and if we want to, 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 to build a society based on this uh, uh, vivre ensemble value. So for me, uh, the, the balance, it's, it's and, and I agree with what have been said by, by um, uh, the, the, uh, by the colleagues. I mean, it's really difficult to, uh, to balance, but uh, it's also very important to keep this uh, balance between and, and necessity and proportionality of um, prohibition or, or acceptance of uh, types of, uh, of discourse. The second element indeed is very, very, very worrying. And in this case, I would, uh, I would of course, I think Europe and France would need to, to take inspiration from the US. And, uh, and, and we are, as a scholar, for instance, especially, I'm really worried on this um, threat on academic freedom, because it's not only a discourse. Uh, maybe you know that uh, the, the French Ministry of uh, Higher Education uh, decided to launch uh, an investigation uh, and on uh, researchers and publications of people who work on the con colonial colonialism and so on and so forth, our history, race theory, etc. So it's not only at the level of political discourse, but it has direct consequences on the way we work and the kind of theory we, for instance, at the university, I teach gender theory. Is it allowed? I don't know, and of course, it's my academic freedom to talk to my students on the gender theory, race theory, et cetera, et cetera. But it's very, uh, in, indeed, uh, this academic freedom uh, issue is very worrying. And um, yeah, the, the rationale of this, of course, I think it's really more political, I would say, that uh, really uh, based on an approach or, or intellectual uh, approach of uni universalism, unfortunately. Mm. Fascinating. Thank you for that. Suzanne, this is a really important, uh, complicated debate. And broadly, it seems to be between the universalistic tradition that President Macron defended in his speech, and which is rooted in the American First Amendment tradition as well, of allowing a, a multiplicity of views to um, uh, flourish without uh, regulation. And uh, uh, well, we'll call it this uh, uh, more particularist uh, tradition, which President Macron associated with uh, critical race theory, which would uh, suggest in the academy and public square that uh, 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 th th there's less grounds for free speech. How would you characterize this debate and, and help us understand how, in this case, it's France that seems to be on the side of universalism? Yeah. Look, I don't think it's that simple. I think there is a kind of intimate interplay between our free speech precepts, you know, the desire to give greater recognition to other identities and experiences, you know, the emphasis that's being placed on critical race theory, the backlash against it. You know, my a lot of my work and my book is about how we can reconcile the imperative of driving toward, forward toward a more equal, inclusive society with robust protections for free speech and academic freedom. And you know, I, I think a lot of that vests really, and you know, going back to something I said in the beginning, it's it's not ultimately, I don't think, going to be resolved by law. I think it's going to be resolved by social norms and taboos and how we figure out how to live together in these diverse societies and where we need to exercise voluntary restraint and how we can communicate to people about the imperative of that and the benefits of that and how that can actually be a, a safeguard itself for free speech. I mean, if the vast majority of us, the vast majority of, of the time 
exercise conscientiousness and discretion and are respectful, I think we can have space at the outer margins for people who want to provoke and challenge, I mean, to Jeff's point, for, uh, and advance heresies that you know, may be destructive, uh, but may also be catalytic. Uh, for social progress. And I think it is by, you know, re sort of revising our set of social norms that govern free speech that we can safeguard and make space for, uh, you know, that which really tests and, and contests them. So that, that's, that's how I look at it. Thank you for that. And I recommend your wonderful book to our viewers, uh, which argues, among other things, that many of these debates must be resolved, not by law, but by norms. Well, Marc Olivier, you have a tough uh, or an, an honored uh, position, which is the last word in this great discussion. And I'll leave it to you to leave our listeners with, as, as an astute observer of American and French society, uh, how do you see the similarities and differences between French and American approaches to free speech? There's um, the, the, the question of uh, the norms and the, the way that we uh, negotiate all, all those questions are, are really important. And one of the things that struck me in the year that I have passed in, in, in the US as a Neiman fellow, I did the Neiman, the fellowship has just come to an end. And I've been struck by the number of journalists who have lost their job because of a misplaced tweet, uh, recent or in their past. And um, there's an, an element where I can take a normative stance. And I think that in terms of protection of workers, it would be great if the, 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 the US take a bit of inspiration from France, because it, I, I believe there's a tendency to fire a bit people a bit too fast. And instead, so it, it looks as if the management has taken into consideration the problem and has moved and done something about it. But in fact, it's just getting rid of the problem and the questions are not really asked. If you, if you don't have the room to make mistake and then discuss it as a practitioner of, 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 a, of free speech, of a freedom of expression and freedom of the press, and then decide, well, why didn't it work? Why, what's the problem with that? And if you're just fired and then disappear, the, 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 the incentive is simply to take less risk and not to assess the risk and try to decide how is it, how is it how is the good way to conduct a uh, democratic debate in the opinion pages of any given uh, uh, newspapers? So in terms of law, I would say <laughs> I would follow uh, Biden's call to uh, strengthen unions, <laughs> but that's really um, maybe more of a joke, but I think a, a general uh, observation, I think that this uh, the aspect of the, 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 the work relations are also really important in the practice of, of uh, free speech. It's a crucial point. And thank you for reminding us and teaching us that in France, there are protections for workers being fired on the basis of speech that don't exist in the US. And in that respect, uh, uh, we might indeed uh, in the US take a uh, lesson from France. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff Stone, Hélène, Digoudia, Suzanne Nossel, and Marc-Olivier Béret for a, just a wonderful discussion of similarities and differences between French and American approaches to free speech. And thank you so much, Vincent Michelot, the, uh, the cultural services of the French embassy for having conceived of this important uh, series to the ambassador, uh, Philippe Etienne, who's uh, been defending free speech and is also supporting our joint collaboration very much in the tradition of Jusserand, Lafayette, Rochambeau, and all those great French heroes who inspired me during my walk in Rock Creek and who inspire all of us with our shared devotion to the universal principles of liberty, fraternity, and equality. Look forward to our next convening very soon. And until then, thank you and a bientôt. Bye everyone, thank you.